Hello there. Welcome once more to this YouTube channel. Kindly subscribe to this channel. The topic is Applied Anatomy of the Neck. This is part one of the lecture. Applied Anatomy of the Neck. I'm going to start right away with spread of infection in the neck. Spread of infection in the neck. I love the investing layer of deep cervical fascia because it helps to prevent the spread of abscesses caused by tissue destruction. When there is an infection in the region of the neck, if such infection occurs between the investing layer of deep cervical fascia and the muscular part of the pretracheal fascia, the pretracheal fascia, that the muscular part is actually the part that surrounds the infrahoid muscle. So if you have an infection occurring between the investing layer of deep cervical fascia and the muscular part of the pretracheal fascia, such infection usually will not spread beyond the superior edge of the manibrum. That is because of the attachment of the investing layer of deep cervical fascia. But if the infection occurs between the investing layer of deep cervical fascia and the visceral part of the pretracheal fascia, such infection may spread into the thoracic cavity anterior to the pericardium. So you have you pause from an abscess posterior to the prevertebral layer of deep cervical fascia may extend laterally in the neck and this forms a swelling posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The pulse may perforate the prevertebral layer of deep cervical fascia and, and uh, enter the retropharyngeal space. So at the end of the day, you have a bulge in the pharynx, what is called the retropharyngeal abscess. Right here is an illustration of the deep ne neck spaces. Uh, the deep fascia of the neck is um, uh, can be appreciated there, the various layers and then the spaces that they enclose. I really need to go on to talk about nerve blocks in the lateral cervical region. Regional anesthesia can be given for surgical procedures in the neck region or upper limb region. So when you want to do that, you might have to resort to a cervical plexus block. In this procedure, an anesthetic agent is injected at several points along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid. Mostly you need to really um, inject so much solution at the junction of the superior and middle thirds of the sternocleidomastoid. This uh, point is called the nerve point of the neck. To get anesthesia of the upper limb, the anesthetic agent in the supraclavicular brachial uh, nerve plexus, you could do a um, supraclavicular brachial plexus block for you to get anesthesia of the upper limb. So when you're doing that, you inject the anesthetic solution around the supraclavicular part of the brachial plexus. So the main injection site is superior to the midpoint of the clavicle in the case of the supraclavicular brachial plexus block. Very important for procedures that involve a, you need anesthesia of the upper limb. Right here you see an illustration of the brachial plexus, the nerves that you have there. So it's actually the nerves you are in, interested in blocking when you're doing the brachial ple, supraclavicular brachial plexus uh, block. In a, when doing surgery for part of the upper limb. So the cervical, uh, the nerves are illustrated there. Now, what about subclavian vein puncture? The right or left subclavian veins, uh, either of them is often the point of entry to the venous system when you want to do central line placement. Central line placements need to be done when there is need to administer parenteral uh, fluids like venous nutrition and also medications, intravenous uh, medications. Central lines are also inserted when you need to uh, measure the central venous pressure. The pleura or the pleural subclavian artery 
are in danger of puncture when you're doing a subclavian vein puncture. So you need to be careful. Right here is an illustration of the site where you do a subclavian vein puncture. Permit me to talk about prominence of external jugular vein. The external jugular vein serves as an internal barometer. That's when you need to um, get the venous pressure, you might need to observe the prominence of external jugular vein. So when venous pressure is in the normal range, the external jugular vein is usually visible superior to the mandible for only a short distance. But when venous pressure rises, like in cases of heart failure, the external jugular vein is prominent throughout its course along the side of the neck. So in such a case, once you see that it's prominent throughout its course along the side of the neck, you suspect that venous pressure is increased and uh, like in cases of heart failure. So routine observation of the, of the, for distension of the external jugular vein is very important when you're doing physical examination because it can give you signs of a, uh, give diagnostic signs of heart failure. Also, it could give you sign that there is obstruction of the superior vena cava. It could also point to enlarged supraclavicular lymph nodes or increased intrathoracic pressure. Right here is an illustration of the external jugular vein. Lesions of the spinal accessory nerve is what I want to talk about now. Such lesions are not common, but the spinal accessory nerve may be damaged when there is penetrating trauma and also it could be damaged in the course of surgical procedures. Also tumors around the neck could damage the spinal accessory nerves. Also you still have fractures of the jugular foramen uh, being, uh, co uh, appearing with complication of uh, in the form of a lesion of the spinal accessory nerve. When there is a unilateral lesion of the spinal accessory nerve it usually does not produce an abnormal, abnormal position of the neck. But weakness, can, you can observe weakness when turning the head to one side against resistance. Lesions of the spinal accessory nerve, which is the 11th cranial nerve, produce weakness and atrophy of the trapezius. So the, you have drooping of the shoulder as an obvious, obvious sign when there is injury to the spinal accessory nerve. Unilateral paralysis of the trapezius is, is um, you suspect it when the patient is unable to elevate and retract the shoulder. And also such patient has difficulty in elevating the arm superiorly to the horizontal level. Right here is an illustration of the spinal accessory nerve, the cause of the spinal accessory nerve. You can see it there colored yellow. The spinal accessory nerve is colored yellow. What about severance of the phrenic nerve and phrenic nerve block? Severance of the phrenic nerve, which is, um, you remember the phrenic nerve uh, uh, that comes one of the branches from the cervical plexus from C4, then co with contributions from C3 and, and C5. So, severance of the phrenic nerve results in paralysis of the corresponding half of the diaphragm. A phrenic nerve block may need to be given and it, give, it produces a short period of paralysis of the diaphragm on one side. That is necessary in the case of certain procedures like long operation. So in such a case, the anesthetic agent is injected around the phrenic nerve where it lies on the anterior surface of the anterior scalene muscle. You can see that illustrated there in that um, diagram. The phrenic nerve has a blue color there. Ligation of the external carotid artery is what I want to talk about now. You could have ligation of the external carotid artery done to control bleeding from one of its uh, inaccessible branches so this produces decrease in blood flow through the artery and its branches 
but it does not eliminate blood flow. When the external carotid or subclavian arteries are ligated, the descending branch of the occipital artery provides the main collateral circulation. Anastomosin with the vertebral and deep cervical arteries. Right there, you can see branches of the external carotid artery. There are also branches of the internal carotid artery. So anastomosis can occur be between the branches. Let me talk about surgical dissec dissection of carotid triangle. The carotid triangle provides an important surgical approach to the carotid system of arteries. It also gives approach, surgical approach to the internal jugular vein, the vagus nerves and the hypoglossal nerve. The cervical sympathetic trunk is, can be reached via the carotid triangle. When there is damage or compression of the vagus or recurrent laryngeal nerves, in the course of surgical dissection of the carotid triangle, you could have alteration in the voice because the nerves, the vagus and the recurrent laryngeal nerves supply the laryngeal muscles. Right here is an illustration of the carotid triangle and the contents that you have in the carotid triangle. Carotid pulse is what I want to talk about, carotid pulse. The carotid pulse is also called the neck pulse. You can palpate it. You can palpate the common carotid artery in the side of the neck, where it lies in a groove between the trachea and the infrahoid muscles. You can easily palpate uh, it just deep to the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid at the level of the superior border of the thyroid cartilage. The carotid pulse is uh, routinely checked in the course of procedures like when you're doing cardiopulmonary resuscitation. You need to check it because absence of the carotid pulse indicates cardiac arrest. Right here is an illustration of the palpation of the carotid pulse, that's the neck pulse. What about carotid occlusion and end activectomy? You could have atherosclerotic thickening of the intima, that's the innermost coat of the internal carotid artery. This uh, obstructs blood flow. In such a case, you could have symptoms that the symptoms you have depend on the degree of obstruction and the amount of collateral blood flow to the brain from other arteries. You could have a partial occlusion and this causes transient ischemic, ischemic attack, what we call TIA. Then you could have a sudden focal loss of neurological function. You see it in form of dizziness and disorientation. This disappears within 24 hours. This is what you actually call the transient ischemic attack. Carotid occlusion causes stenosis, that's narrowing of the carotid artery, the, um, like the internal carotid artery. And this can be re relieved by opening the artery at its origin and stripping off the atherosclerotic plaque with the intima. This procedure is called carotid end atherectomy. Note that because of the relations of the internal carotid artery, there is risk of cranial nerve injury in the course of carotid end atherectomy. So these nerves, some nerves, cranial nerves may be injured. Such nerves include the ninth cranial nerve, that's the glossopharyngeal nerve. Also the vagus nerve, that's the 10th cranial nerve, or its branch, the superior laryngeal nerve, may be injured. The 11th cranial nerve and 12th cranial nerve, that's the accessory and hypoglossal nerves respectively, may also be injured. So in the course of carotid end atherectomy, one needs to be careful so that you don't create more problems than the patient came with. Now let me talk about the internal jugular 
pulse. Pulsations of the internal jugular vein can provide some clue about heart activity, which just like you have the electrocardiogram, the electrocardiogram recording that uh, gives you some clue about heart activity. So pulsations of the internal jugular vein will give you clue about heart activity. It could also give you some clue about right atrial pressure. The pulsations of the internal jugular vein are transmitted through the surrounding tissues and may be observed deep to the sternocleidomastoid, superior to the medial end of the clavicle. The brachiocephalic vein has no valves and the superior vena cava also has no valves. So a wave of contraction passes up these um, veins to the internal jugular vein. So the pulsations of the internal jugular vein are visible when the person's head is inferior to the feet. At that uh, position, we say it's the trendy, trendy lobug position, trendy lobug position. So you see the pulsations of the internal jugular vein clearly when the patient's head is inferior to the feet, the trendelenburg position. The internal jugular pulse increases markedly in, condi in conditions like mitral valve disease. So in such condition, you have increased pressure in the pulmonary circulation and the right side of the heart. Now, what about internal jugular vein puncture? You, a needle and catheter may be inserted into the internal jugular vein. So this is done for diagnostic purpose. This is also done for therapeutic purpose. The right internal jugular vein is, uh, we love it. It's preferable because it's usually larger and it is straighter. So in the course of internal jugular vein puncture, the clinician palpates the common carotid artery and inserts the needle into the internal jugular vein, just lateral to the common carotid artery at, an, at a 30 degree angle. And as he does this, he aims at the apex of the triangle between the sternal and the clavicular heads of the sternocleidomastoid. Right here is an illustration of internal jugular vein puncture. Now it's time to talk about surface anatomy of cervical regions and, and triangles of the neck. Don't forget that the skin of the neck is thin and pliable. The subcutaneous connective tissue contains a muscle we call the platysma, a thin sheet of striated muscle that ascends to the face. The sternocleidomastoid muscle is broad and is the key muscular landmark of the neck. The sternocleidomastoid defines the sternocleidomastoid region and divides the neck into anterior and posterior triangles or what some call the anterior and lateral cervical regions. The sternocleidomastoid muscle is easy to observe and you can palpate it through its length as it passes superiorly from the clavicle and manibrum to the mastoid process of the temporal bone. The sternocleidomastoid you need can be made to stand out when, when uh, someone rotates, you, the person rotates the face towards the contralateral side and elevates the chin. So the sternocleidomastoid becomes very um, obvious. You can observe it that way. The external jugular vein runs vertically across the sternocleidomastoid towards the angle of the mandible. The external jugular vein may be prominent especially if it's distended and you can observe it by asking the person to take a deep breath 
what we call the Vasava Manova. The jugular notch in the manibrum is the fossa between the sternal heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. What about the trapezius? It defines the posterior cervical region, the posterior triangle of the neck. It can be observed and palpated by asking the person to shrewd the shoulders against resistance. Just inferior to the belly of the omohoid is the greater supraclavicular fossa. It's the depression overlying the homoclavicular triangle. The subclavian arterial pulsations can be palpated in the homoclavicular triangle. So in the homoclavicular triangle, one can palpate the subclavian artery and feel the pulsations. The occipital triangle contains the spinal accessory nerve. That is the 11th cranial nerve. Because um, this nerve is vulnerable to injury and um, what we call the atrogenic injury in the course of medical treatment, it said certain uh, procedures and uh, you don't uh, damage the nerve and cause more problems for the patient. The submandibular gland nearly fills the submandibular triangle. Remember the submandibular triangle is one of the divisions of the anterior triangle of the neck. The submandibular lymph nodes lie superficial to the submandibular salivary gland and if enlarged, the submandibular lymph nodes can be palpated by moving the fingers from the angle of the mandible along its inferior border. When you continue moving the fingers this way, the fingers will meet under the chin from both sides. You feel enlarged, you can now feel under the chin, right under the chin, you feel enlarged submental lymph nodes. You palpate them in the submental triangle. What about the carotid arterial system located in the carotid triangle? The carotid triangle is one of the divisions of the anterior triangle of the neck. The carotid sheath can be mapped out by a line joining the sternoclavicular joints. Draw a line from the sternoclavicular joint to a point midway between the mastoid process and the angle of the mandible. That line you drew from the sternoclavicular joint to a point midway between the mastoid process and the angle of the mandible. That line defines the carotid sheath. The carotid pulse can be palpated by placing the index and third fingers, that's the middle finger, on the thy thyroid cartilage and pointing them posteriorly between the trachea and the sternocleidomastoid. The carotid pulse is palpable just medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Right here is an illustration of the triangles of the neck. You can see the sternocleidomastoid there, defining the separating the anterior triangle from the posterior triangle of the neck. So you can see both triangles of the neck illustrated there. So there you see also the body of the mandible, the hide bone, bifurcation of the common carotid artery, the thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage of the larynx, then you can see the base between the third and fourth tracheal rings, the manibrum sternum and the clavicle of both sides and the subclavian artery. Here also is an illustration of the surface anatomy of the anterior triangle of the neck, the mastoid muscle there, the anterior belly of the digastric muscle is also there, posterior belly of the digastric muscle is there, defining the both bellies define the submandibular triangle. Then the omohoid muscle is also there. The thyroid cartilage is shown there. Digastric triangle is there, one of the divisions of the anterior triangle. The carotid triangle is also seen there. The cricoid cartilage is seen and the muscular triangle is there.
close to the midline is also one of the divisions of the anterior triangle of the neck. This is a further illustration here and another illustration here showing the surface anatomy of the carotid arteries and internal jugular vein. You can see the common carotid artery, the internal carotid artery, external carotid artery and the point of access to common carotid artery. The internal jugular vein is there. Where you assess the internal jugular vein is also um, pinpointed there. And the point of uh, access to the internal jugular vein, you could access it above the stenocledomastoid. That point of access is there. You could also access it between the heads of the stenocledomastoid. It's indicated there. And the cricotyre puncture center is there. Let me talk about lesions of the cervical sympathetic trunk. You could have a lesion of the cervical sympathetic trunk in the neck. So this results in serious disturbance, sympathetic disturbance, which is called the Horner syndrome. What happens in Horner syndrome? How do you know when someone has Horner syndrome? There is pupillary constriction. Pupillary constriction results from paralysis of the dilator pupillae muscle. There is ptosis, drooping of the that is ptosis is droop, drooping of the superior eyelid. Ptosis re results from paralysis of the smooth muscle. That's the uh, smooth muscle you find in the tarsal muscle. The tarsal muscle is a smooth muscle, not a striated muscle. So ptosis is caused by paralysis of the smooth tarsal muscle together with paralysis of the striated muscle of the levato palpebrae superioris. Sinking in of the eyeball and lophamos is also seen in Horner syndrome. This is caused by the paralysis of the smooth orbitalis muscle in the floor of the orbit. There is also vasodilation and absence of sweating on the face and neck, what we call anhydrosis, caused by lack of sympathetic nerve supply to the blood vessels and sweat glands. Right here is an illustration of what occurs in Horner's syndrome. Thyroidectomy is what I need to talk about now. In the course of total thyroidectomy, for example, when there is cancer of the thyroid glands, one needs to be careful because the parathyroid glands are in danger of being damaged or removed. The parathyroid glands are safe when you're doing subtotal thyroidectomy because the most posterior part of the thyroid gland usually is preserved in the course of subtotal thyroidectomy. The parathyroid glands have variable position because of the variability in the position of the parathyroid glands especially the inferior ones there is risk of danger of uh, the parathyroid glands being removed during surgery on the thyroid gland right here is an illustration of the anatomy of the thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland the relations of the thyroid glands are shown there the accessory thyroid gland tissue needs to be mentioned here. The accessory thyroid gland tissue develops in the neck lateral to the thyroid cartilage. Usually, the accessory thyroid gland lies on the thyroid muscle. The pyramidal lobe and, the, and its connective tissue continuation may also contain thyroid tissue. Accessory thyroid tissue like that of the pyramidal lobe originates from remnants of the thyroglossal ducts. Remember the thyroglossal duct is a transistory endodermal tube that extends from the posterior tongue region of the embryo carrying the tongue forming tissue as it, descend, as it descends at its descending distal end. Although the accessory thyroid tissue may be functional it's usually too small to maintain normal function of the thyroid gland if thyroid gland is removed. Right here is an illustration of sites where you could have accessory thyroid gland tissue. 
it could be in the lingua region close to the tongue we say there is lingua that's lingua thyroid we could also have intralingua thyroid if you have thyroglossal duct cyst you could have um, thyroid gland in no- normal position there and intra tracheal position and then it could also be so low and you have it in the mediastinal position now let me mention surface anatomy of the larynx the u-shaped high bone lies superior to the thyroid cartilage at the level of c4 and c5 vertebrae that's the fourth and fifth cervical vertebrae the laryngeal prominence is seen on the neck you can see it on the neck especially in males is very prominent and if the laryngeal prominence is produced by the fused laminae of the thyroid cartilage these laminae meet in the median plane the cricoid cartilage can be felt inferior to the laryngeal prominence the cricoid cartilage lies at the level of the c6 vertebra that's the sixth cervical vertebra right here is an illustration of the surface anatomy of the larynx showing clearly the laryngeal prominence what some call the adam's apple in the male it's very prominent then the cricoid cartilage is also shown there now what about injury to the laryngeal laryngeal nerves what happens when there's injury to the laryngeal nerves the inferior laryngeal nerves are vulnerable to injury during thyroidectomy and other surgical procedures that take place in the anterior triangles of the neck. Because the inferior laryngeal nerve innervates the muscles moving the vocal fold, injury results, injury of the inferior laryngeal nerve results in paralysis of the vocal fold. So you have a person having very poor voice it affects the quality of the voice the voice is initially poor because the paralyzed vocal folds cannot adduct they can't meet the one on the paralyzed side cannot meet with the normal vocal fold when there is bilateral um, paralysis of the vocal folds the voice is almost lost so you the voice is almost absent because the vocal folds are left in motionless position that is slightly narrower than the usual neutral respiratory position. Hoarseness is the most common symptom of serious disorders of the larynx such as carcinoma of the vocal folds. What about fractures of the laryngeal skeleton? This may result from blows like in sports and uh, some form of sports, boxing, hockey and all that and then you could also have fractures of laryngeal skeleton occurring as a result of shoulder strap injury that results from a automobile accident laryngeal fractures produce subcutaneous submucous hemorrhage and there is also edema respiratory obstruction also occurs there is hoarseness of the voice and at times you have temporary inability to speak I really need to mention laryngoscopy. The larynx may be examined visually by indirect laryngoscopy or or direct laryngoscopy. In the course of indirect laryngoscopy, which is uh, illustrated there, what you have here, the first illustration is that of direct laryngoscopy. What happens in direct laryngoscopy? Use a tubular endoscopic instrument, the laryngoscope that has light and it has a a, a a video camera at the end so you use it to see to look directly into the to look at the larynx in indirect laryngoscopy use a laryngeal mirror so you place that in the mouth you put it at the towards the posterior end to the take it to the posterior end of the mouth of the truth and the the glass side of the mirror faces um, inferior and then you now raise the mirror towards superior in the mouth while at the while the mirror is placed at the posterior end of the mouth and then you view you can now view the larynx indirectly so that is indirect laryngoscopy so direct laryngoscopy is illustrated here you can see the laryngoscope direct laryngoscopy using a laryngoscope 
indirect laryngoscopy using a laryngeal mirror. Now, aspiration of foreign bodies. What about aspiration of foreign bodies? A foreign object like a piece of stick may accidentally get through the laryngeal, laryngeal inlet into the vestibule of the larynx. Then it becomes trapped superior to the vestibular folds. When a foreign object enters the vestibule, the laryngeal muscles go into spasm and this tenses the vocal folds. The rima glottidis closes and no air enters the trachea. So there is asphyxiation and the person will die in, within five minutes from lack of oxygen if this obstruction is not removed. So what you do, it's an emergency and you really need to open the airway. So what you could do, a tracheotomy or tracheostomy to open the airway so that the person can breathe. So that takes me to tracheotomy and tracheostomy. A transverse incision through the skin of the neck and anterior wall of the trachea is called tracheostomy. This establishes an airway in patients with upper airway obstruction or respiratory failure. The infrahoid muscles are retracted laterally in the, in the course of the procedure and the isthmus of the thyroid gland is either divided or retracted superiorly. An opening is made in the trachea between the first and second tracheal rings or through the second. You, make, you can do the opening through the second, third and fourth tracheal rings. The tracheostomy tube is then inserted into the trachea and secured. You really need to avoid complications during the tracheostomy. So you must note the anatomical relations. The anatomical relationships that are important are as follows. The inferior thyroid veins must be noted as they arise from a venous plexus on the thyroid gland and the said anterior to the trachea. Also, you must remember the small thyroid artery which is present in about 10% of people. The thyroid artery ascends from the brachiocephalic trunk or the arc of the aorta to the isthmus of the thyroid gland. You must not neglect the left brachiocephalic vein, the jugular venous arc and pleura must also be remembered, particularly in infants and children. The thymus gland is also there. The thymus, which covers the inferior part of the trachea, is also very worthy of noting infants and children. The trachea is small uh, in um, infants. It is small, mobile and soft. So it's easy to cut through the posterior wall and damage the esophagus in infants. So you really need to go uh, very carefully. Right here is an illustration of the uh, tracheostomy tube in place and the anatomical relations that you need to note that I just mentioned. The next diagram also illustrating tracheostomy. You have tracheostomy and uh, tracheotomy. Tracheotomy and tracheostomy illustrated there. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Goodbye for now.